Hi, I'm uh, Dr. Kai Hong Pua from the National University of Singapore, speaking to you from Kazakhstan, where I'm currently a visit professor to Nazarbayev University. I would like to add to the special tributes to Professor Saw, as his former colleague from the NUS, where my ex department is now called the Saw Sui Hock School of Public Health. Professor Saw was a professor of statistics and was known as the father of demography demography in Singapore when I first got to know him after obtaining my PhD in social policy at LSE to become the first health economist in Singapore. Professor Saw then telephoned me when I was the president of the London School of Economics Alumni Association of Singapore to inquire what he could do for the alumni. He subsequently hosted a function at his home and I became an active patron for our alumni activities in Singapore. I started at the LSE Distinguished Alumni Awards in Singapore, and our first award went to LSE Fellow, Dr. Go King Sui. Later awards, uh, as well as LSE Fellows that were appointed were Professor Yu Po Singh, uh, Mr. Tarman Shamugaratnam, and of course, Professor Saw Sui Hock. Professor Saw also received the LSE Patron Award at the 40th anniversary celebrations of the LSE Alumni Association in Singapore in 2013. Thank you, Professor Saw, for giving so generously to the Alumni Association, the LSE Trust in Singapore, and the Alma Mater. Thank you. It is an honour to be giving a tribute today to Professor Saw, a man I first knew as uncle, father to my friend and schoolmate Xiang Mei. It was not until I was on the LSE Trust that I realised what a trailblazer in philanthropy he was. The LSE Trust was set up in 2004 to provide financial scholarship for school fees to LSE students who had gained admission to the LSE to study there. Professor Saw was known for his unflinching generosity whenever trustees approached him for supporting such scholarships. After studying in the University of Malaya in Singapore, he decided to pursue a PhD in statistics through a scholarship. And he went there with his newly married wife who also pursued a PhD. No wonder LSE had such special memories for him and London remained his favourite place to travel to. And on his frequent visits, he made visits to the LSE to ensure that he stayed connected to the mission and needs of the school. He believed in social mobility through education and became an educator himself. He did much research and publication on many subjects varying from economics, statistics, finance and population. Through his foresight and acumen in finance and statistics, he managed to invest in some real estate in the 1970s and 80s in Singapore. The accretion and value of these investments, coupled with his magnanimous nature, facilitated his contributions to many organisations and noteworthy causes. He is much revered by those to whom he came into contact with and always had a welcoming smile as well as a sense of humour. Hi. My name is Gerrit Limshington and I'm speaking to you from Singapore. It is an honour for me to talk about the late Prof. Saw. I want to talk about his giving and philanthropy, the profound impact he has had on all of us here in Singapore, not the least in the school. I have known Prof. Saw since 2008. He was already an active part of the alumni community in Singapore before me and our paths crossed as I headed and led the association for several years and am a member of the Singapore LSE Trust. In the bi-monthly lunches we've had recently, in reg regularly in recent years, just the two of us, we talked about ordinary things, family, friends, and projects as I listened intently as he spoke from experience and wisdom with a passion and humility. Often, our meeting would begin with him handing me a book which he recently published or an idea, such as when he excitedly handed me a file of the Southeast Asia Centre when it was still a blueprint. He was a kind and gentle man with a DNA to give. In his words, Garage, you cannot make someone give. It is in his or her DNA to do so. But with a twinkle in his eye, he also said, we can encourage them to do so by doing so. 
Prof. Song was recognised both formally and informally for the transformational nature of his giving as one of Asia's leading philanthropists, particularly in education. His giving has brought lasting change, embracing education, research and the community. Well, thank you, everyone. Hello uh, and welcome to today's events. My name is Minu Shafiq and I'm the director of the London School of Economics and Political Science. It was so moving to hear those wonderful comments from about Professor Sosri Huck from our alumni, Patricia Garrick and Kai Hong. We're here today to remember Professor Saw or Prof Saw, as we all affectionately called him to discuss the role of philanthropy in society in recognition of his generosity to LSE and to many other educational causes in Singapore and around the region. On a personal note, as the director of the LSE, it was often the highlight of my visits to Singapore to sit down with Professor Saul, where I was always warmly welcomed in his second home, the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies at NUS. He always met me with a large stack of papers in front of him, which had all the correspondence he had ever had with the LSE. And of course, he was across all the issues and completely on top of the numbers, as you would expect from a graduate of our statistics department. And he would ever so gently hold me to account, making sure that we had done what we promised and that we were delivering on, on his extraordinary philanthropy. And he did it in the nicest possible way. We'd also discuss a broad range of subjects, ranging from research and teaching to statistics and developments in data sciences, public policy, and of course, the students from Singapore and the surrounding region at the LSE and how they were doing. He loved hosting the alumni community in Singapore and was really the father of our alumni community there. And he also has a special place in the heart of every student at the LSE with the Sosui Huck building, which houses our student union and which is on the heart, in the heart of our campus. We're very delighted and honored to have Professor Saw's family members in the audience, and of course, so many of his friends in Singapore and across Southeast Asia. Thank you so much for being with us today. Now, the importance of philanthropy and its impact, of course, is not new. Philanthropy and faith-based institutions and charities have played a key role for years as an important complement to state financing in delivering key aspects of the social contract throughout human history, and in many ways preceded the state. But philanthropy has changed enormously in recent years. We've seen a massive growth in the assets that philanthropists own. Global foundation assets now exceed 1.5 trillion. And we face huge significant challenges ranging from sustainability to inclusive growth. And philanthropists are increasingly at the forefront of thinking about how to tackle that. In honor of Prof. Saw, we have a stellar panel of people to discuss these issues and his legacy. We start with LSE alumnus Tarman Shanmugatharatam, who's the senior minister in Singapore and has served for several years as deputy prime minister and finance minister. He's also coordinating minister for social policies and chairs the National Jobs Council aimed at building skills and jobs in the wake of COVID-19. Tarman also chair, is chairman of Singapore's central bank and financial regulator. Tarman will be followed by Shailene Nyanalingam, who is from Malaysia and leads her family office from Hong Kong, where she now lives. The family focuses on philanthropic endeavors such as improving women's rights, racial justice, and education. She's a member of the Maverick Collective, which is created to change how women engage in philanthropy, providing a sharp focus on the health and rights of girls and women. After Shireen, we'll hear from Professor Stephen Chambers, who's the director of the Marshall Institute here at the LSE, established by Paul Marshall to increase the impact of private contributions for the public benefit. Uh, Stefan is also a professor of practice in the Department of Management at LSE and course director for our new executive masters in social business and entrepreneurship. 
And finally, we'll hear from Professor Hyun Shin, who's the director of the Saw Sweet Hawk Southeast Asia Center here at the LSE and also professor of geography and urban studies in our department of geography. And I really look forward to hearing all of their thoughts. Before we begin, for the Twitter users in the audience, the hashtag for today's event is hashtag LSE post COVID. And this online event is being recorded and will be made available afterwards. As usual, there'll be a chance for questions and answers at the end of this. Please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and questions will be submitted and collected by my colleague, Professor Shin, and he'll pose as many of them to the panel as we can. Please let us know your name and affiliation if you do ask a question. And I'm now delighted to hand over to my very esteemed and wonderful colleague, Senior Minister Tarman, to start our discussion. Thanks, uh, Minush. Uh, thanks for letting me join you on this uh, uh, panel. Uh, it's very good to be together with you again, and very good to be together with Charlene and Stefan Chambers and um, Hyun Shin. It's a real privilege for me to be part of this event uh, because it's also about Professor Sosui Hawk, whom I I had great affection for and great respect for. Um, as I was thinking about uh, what to say in my brief remarks, uh, I realized that there was something about Professor Shaw that had uh, uh, has great meaning in today's crisis. Uh, Saw Sui Hong thought very long and hard about what he should contribute to. Uh, and it turns out that his thinking uh, has really been spot on. Uh, a significant part of his uh, philanthropy has been directed to education, universities, R&D. Uh, and one of his most meaningful gifts uh, was a decade ago uh, in the setting up of the Saw Sui Hock School of Public Health in the National University of Singapore which has turned out to be a real asset in the COVID-19 pandemic, a real asset. Um, he may not have realized how important it is going to be, but I'm sure he knew this would be the way in which you can multiply resources for the benefit of society. And the Saucy Hawk School of Public Health has been a key partner of government in Singapore, as well as government and other partners of the region and globally in the last two years in the COVID-19 crisis. It's been doing valuable work on the science of the virus itself, uh, the epidemiological uh, evidence, which required, which has been um, uh, trickier than normal to interpret. And it's also been doing very interesting work on um, the non-pharmaceutical interventions, a bit of a technical term, but it refers to the whole set of um, social guidelines and restrictions uh, uh, that are uh, also a critical complement uh, to public policy and um, social responsibility in this crisis. And the research that's being done there is also going to be uh, instructive in the way we handle future health crises. Um, so I, I really want to uh, acknowledge that very important investment uh, that Professor Saw made in setting up the Sociol School of Public Health uh, and it's an example of how we really have to think long term in philanthropy. There's a lot of short term needs that are also very useful to cover, but the long term needs are the ones which multiply uh, uh, impact and serve the social good in ways which um, uh, many other investors, including many governments, unfortunately, um, are not sufficiently focused on internationally. Um, more broadly, in fact, what we've seen in this crisis is the benefit of philanthropies. Globally, people like Wellcome Trust, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Gates Foundation, having invested early and consistently in R&D, in public health interventions. Um, very often, particularly at the early stage, these are what you'd call high-risk investments without strong commercial incentive, because once you discount the risk, it offers a very low return or sometimes uncertain return. Um, and it's been extremely important. For instance, in the, I mean, if you think about the mRNA vaccines, it actually came out of many years 
of investment. And when it first started, it wasn't very clear at all uh, that this was going to be a fruitful endeavor. But there were investments, and they finally paid off hugely in this crisis. Likewise, as we look to the future now, you know, if you think of the problems we already see today in the rollout of the vaccine, apart from lack of vaccine supply, which is a big issue, but when we think about the problems on the ground, one of the issues is the fact that some vaccines have required um, uh, ultra cold, uh, ultra cold cold chains uh, to be able to um, uh, distribute uh, in countries. And many countries don't have those ultra cold uh, cold chains. So the development of new vaccines that are what you call thermostable, uh, able to tolerate normal temperatures uh, that you find, or just slightly cold temperatures um, at, at, the, uh, at most, uh, is extremely important for the developing world. And secondly, the ability to develop vaccines that are much cheaper to manufacture and to deliver is extremely important. And we have to think about that, because when you think about developing vaccines and other medical countermeasures, it's not just the richest and most best, the best equipped nations we should think about. We should think about the bulk of humanity. Think about how you can make it suitable for the environments where people live in, make it cheap and affordable. And the investments that are now necessary, which are uh, being marshaled by the by CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation, which has been playing a major role, in fact, um, in this crisis, including, in fact, the Moderna vaccine uh, uh, was one which CEPI was instrumental in. Uh, CEPI is now marshaling resources for this next generation of vaccines. A second element, apart from what I just spoke about, which is vaccines that are suitable for use in developing countries. A second element has to do with the, the need for what you might call multiplex vaccines, vaccines that are able to provide immunity against a broad range of pathogens. Even if it's just coronaviruses, the next stage of vaccine development is about a vaccine that can deliver protection against all coronaviruses. It's still a, a uphill target, but the science, is, the science is there, and there's very intensive work taking place now. So it's an example, again, where the philanthropies come in early in the act, coupled with some public uh, resources. There isn't a very strong commercial incentive initially. But a third way in which um, the philanthropies are very useful is in de-risking investments to enable private capital to come in. And that too is important because there's some investments where you can attract private capital. Uh, they're not ultra high risk, but you can attract private capital, but you need some de-risking. And research into the next generation of TB vaccines is a good example. TB, by the way, is still a huge killer around the world. Until COVID-19 came, it was the largest killer, uh, about 1.4 million deaths a year. Um, and because it's happening continually, five years of TB is more than the number of COVID deaths you'd expect in a, or the number of deaths you'd expect in a typical pandemic. So it's a huge killer. But the existing TB vaccines are only for severe childhood uh, Ill illness. Uh, there's no TB vaccine that protects adults. So this is an extremely important investment. And we have to remember that just because it's not a big disease in the most developed countries doesn't mean it's not important. It's extremely important because it affects a large number of people in the developing world. And here too, there's a need to de-risk investments because it needs money. And the best use of public money and philanthropic money is to de-risk the investment and enable private capital to come in. And that's actually what's happening now. The European Investment Bank, uh, together with the Wellcome Trust and the Gates Foundation, is in fact providing funding to de-risk the investment to enable private capital to come in. So I'm, I'm talking about this because it's actually a very important part of the investment landscape in future public health. It's very important that the philanthropies, together with the public sector, play their role for direct funding of early stage R&D, but also to de-risk investments to enable private capital to come in, not to earn exorbitant returns. In fact, the returns are really in the low single digits, but it still provides a return for portfolios that are long-term in orientation 
and it provides some diversification within those portfolios. Finally, I just want to make a point, a broader point, which uh, Minouche will have a lot of um, um, uh, uh, resonance with. Uh, one of the things that Minouche points out in her book, What We Owe Each Other, is how uh, we have to move beyond just the transactional shifting of resources from one group to another in society. We do need redistribution. And we are probably going to need more redistribution in future than we've had before. Taxes, subsidies, transfers play a role in any, any society that wants to keep, keep everyone together. Government plays a role, but it's not enough. We have to go beyond simply transferring resources. We need people who are better off, people with wealth, to make it part of their own mission to get involved in the rest of society. And it's not just people with wealth, of course, but people with wealth have a particular obligation to get involved because it, it sends a very different signal from merely paying your taxes and having the taxes redistributed. It is really about having a collective interest in the lives of the people who are in the society we live in and the lives of people abroad. It's about collective interest. And that's a, a signal, that's a major point which Minush makes and which many of us make, that developing that culture of solidarity is extremely important for the strength of a society. That culture of lives together and lives together being lives more meaningful is an extremely important part of the strength of a society. And we have to develop that and philanthropists play a special role, not just in writing the checks, but getting involved getting involved in social causes, getting involved with the people who need extra support because they start off with less, never doing it in a way that's too patronizing, doing it in a way, in a way that's respectful and helps everyone develop aspiration, aspirations. Lives together are lives more meaningful and more fulfilling for everyone. So I wanted to end on that note. I think we are moving in the right direction coming out of COVID. We are seeing some semblance of that culture developing, but there is a difference when you look around the world between societies that are coming out of the crisis with people melded together more closely and those that are coming out of the crisis with people more divided than when we started. And that's an extremely important issue for us to think about in public policy, in broader governance, but also the responsibility that we all have philanthropists, corporations, and ordinary people. It's a responsibility we all have. Social culture matters. It matters greatly eventually. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. And that was so well said, so well said, both in terms of the wider strategic issues and the reflections on how ahead of his time Prof Saul was. Let me turn to Shailene next. Thank you. Um, thank you, Senior, Senior Minister Thalman, and thank you, Manish, for having me. Um, it is indeed an honor to be invited to be on this panel. Um, my brother is an alumnus of, alumnus of LSE, and I wanted to follow in his footsteps, but was encouraged elsewhere so that I could have more of a collegiate lifestyle. So I'm pleased that Professor So recognized how important it was for LSE to have this student center, and I'm sure it has greatly contributed to the LSE student experience. Um, in talking about philanthropy, I would like to start with our family's efforts. Um, my father believes that charity begins at home, so we concentrate our efforts through the Westports Foundation to enrich the lives of the community around the island in which we operate. We focus on poverty eradication, education programs, and improving safety and the environment. More recently, as a family, we have also made a gift to the LSE to fund the Growth and Governance Hub in the Inclusion Initiative, with a specific focus on creating an index that measures racial equity in the financial sector, focusing on the S in ESG that is often sidelined. Um, my mother has also been very deeply involved for many years with Sir Optimus International, and that has been the inspiration for my personal philanthropy. Um, I want to bring to the forefront overlooked issues in women's health. This means looking at health not just as eradicating illness, but taking a holistic view of all the issues women face, periods, menopause, unintended pregnancies. 
Women around the world, even in developed nations, are suffering from poverty of voice, choice, and agency over their bodies and health outcomes. Manoush addresses in her book the importance of early childhood education and the additional impact of productivity it would create, especially if opportunity was expanded to include women, minorities, and people in lo with low incomes. For me, even if we get nutrition and early childcare right, many girls are still unable to finish school due to the lack of access to menstrual hygiene products and proper sex education. If we were to, able to keep girls in school, imagine how many more of those lost Einsteins we could unleash and add to the pipeline of talent to achieve a more inclusive and productive workforce. As an illustration, a staggering 75% of girls in Ethiopia do not make it to secondary school. If they were able to complete secondary school, it is estimated that they would contribute an additional $6.8 billion to the Ethiopian economy over their lifetimes. This pandemic has further threatened to undo the enormous strides achieved towards gender equality in recent years. Millions of girls have dropped out of school, gender-based violence has intensified, and more than 2 million women in the US have left the workforce due to layoffs and the burden of homeschooling and child and elder care. A study commissioned by UN Women and the UNDP points to a 9% increase in the poverty rate for women, a rate that was expected to decrease 3% if not for the pandemic. As you can imagine, this will have far-reaching effects for decades to come. The fastest way to end poverty is to invest in women and girls, because when women are healthy, safe, and educated, they can transform societies and lift their communities, creating greater economic prosperity for everyone. An IMF sh study shows that countries with the largest gaps in participation rates could see a 35% increase in their GDP if they were closing the gap, gender gap. But we also live with stigma, and that prevents open conversations about these difficult subjects. Growing up in Malaysia, for example, I was doing a project about AIDS. It was in the early 90s and we were in secondary school, but we were not allowed to use the word condom on a project about AIDS. If you, can even, if you can't even talk about condoms as a way to prevent against AIDS, you can only imagine how taboo it was for us to talk about it against pregnancy. Thinking, the thinking was, if we were to talk about condoms, we would have to talk about sex. If we were to talk about periods, we would have to talk about sex and parents or educators themselves were uncomfortable talking about sex openly. What more with children? Addressing it might be seen as putting ideas into children's heads and by not talking about these things, adults think that they were protecting the children and promoting abstinence. I can tell you that not much has changed in the last 25 years. Sexuality education in Malaysia is still outdated and limited to biology and the reproductive system. There's hardly any talk about emotion, pleasure, boundaries, or most importantly, consent. You know the system has failed when you hear statistics like 14 out of a thousand teenagers get pregnant every year in Malaysia. In Cambodia, that number is even higher with 12% of teens already mothers are pregnant. These pregnancies not only lead to abortions, both safe and unsafe, but also dropping out of school, being ostracized from their families, and the many effects of those outcomes keep girls and their families in a cycle of poverty. Society has failed our youth by hiding in our shame and perpetuating the culture of relentless sexualization and object objectification of women's bodies. Instead, we should be empowering our youth and giving them control over their bodies. In Malaysia, a local nonprofit called Spot Community Project has taken that parent slash educator role and provides age appropriate and culturally sensitive comprehensive sexuality education to youths. Spot uses young adult volunteers who can better connect and educate young people about body autonomy, empowering them to make informed decisions about their reproductive health, and is slowly re reversing entrenched cultural taboos. While we can blame maybe religion or tradition or patriarchal decision-making on perpetuating the gender gap, the truth is that even in the US today, only 1.6% of charitable giving goes to nonprofit organizations dedicated to women and girls. Despite gender exclusivity being a key theme in industry and in popular mainstream media, there is still a dearth of funding and research on topics that affect women, leaving a lot of what we know as anecdotal, and therefore it can be difficult to come up with holistic solutions that address the systems that perpetuate the gender gap. Um, this is one of the reasons why I chose to join the Maverick Collective, a community of women philanthropists making catalytic investments in health and reproductive rights to elevate women and girls everywhere. As background, 
Maverick was created by PSI, one of the largest nonprofit health organizations in the world that nobody has ever heard of. Um, they had, they've been operating for over 50 years and in 40 countries across Africa, Latin America, and Asia, deploying 500 million US dollars annually to design healthcare systems that are more responsive to consumer needs. That was the first thing that was attracting me. They address beneficiaries as consumers and have, had, have made the mindful decision to focus on consumer powered healthcare solutions. As Mavericks, we work through a model of experiential philanthropy to fund innovative pilot programs. It is an immersive journey where we collaborate closely with consumers, global experts, as well as the PSI teams implementing on the ground. And we get hands-on engagement and first-hand education in the projects we fund. We bring also our professional expertise and advocacy, almost akin to a VC model of funding riskier startups that if successful or de-risked as Senior Minister Thalman spoke about earlier, then get support from government or larger foundations to scale up. Maverick Collective has now mobilized over 100 million US dollars in resources across 15 countries, helping over 800 women and girls, 800,000 women and girls live healthier lives. The Maverick project that I chose to build was, the, was to build the infrastructure of PSI's social enterprise unit. It was a perfect way to kickstart my philanthropic journey as it aligned my interests in women's health and impact investing. PSI runs nine social enterprises across 21 countries that generates $33 million in annual revenues. Many of those businesses actually started off as traditional development programs, but when donor funding dried up, they had to find a way to keep going. And while only some of these businesses are currently profitable, our intent is to make all of them financially sustainable and use the profits not only to reinvest in business, but also to, to bring about social impacts to the community in ways that governments or donors are unwilling or unable to. As mentioned, PSI believes that the power and decision belongs in the hands of the people we serve, the consumer. It is inefficient and ineffective to solve problems you do not face, that you do not live. Therefore, many programs at PSI use human-centered design and look to the women we're helping to identify pain points and devise solutions that actually work in their communities and their environments. We're co-creating with our end consumers financially sustainable solutions to increase access, choice, and the quality of affordable health products so that as many people who need them can buy them and do so in a way that respects their dignity and privacy. This has been so important during lockdowns where we had to quickly pivot from using community health workers and brick and mortar stores to developing mobile solutions for telehealth, interactive content, and an e-commerce platform to ensure that consumers had continuous access to sexual and reproductive health products. The pandemic was also actually the spur we needed to innovate towards digital engagement. Through pilots rolled out by PSI in Uganda, South Africa, Central America, and India, we learned that these approaches not only maintain, but actually increase sales as it provides easy, discrete access to a range of products and services. Our grand vision is to create a lifestyle brand that will accompany a woman through different stages of her sexual and reproductive life, from menstruation to menopause, providing her with reliable information, decision-making support, access to quality products, and advice from a like-minded community. We want to put power into the hands of girls through education, access, and affordability. As I said before, um, poverty comes in many forms, and we must acknowledge that women worldwide are facing poverty of choice, voice, and agency over their own bodies. We see this across the globe with unintended teen pregnancy. We see this in the US today with a ban on abortions in Texas. We see this in the UK, where two out of five girls face period poverty and cannot afford proper menstrual hygiene products, keeping them out of school. Closing the gender gap requires in innovative and strategic investments in women and girls' health. It requires philanthropists to invest in systems change and drive funding towards researching health issues that are considered taboo and to really listen to the needs of women and girls. As philanthropists, we need to make smart, innovative investments, be open to failure, and that's how we can evolve and find effective solutions to some of the world's most pressing issues. Thank you. Thank you, Shailene, particularly for outlining that innovative approach to, to your own philanthropy and, and sharing those lessons with us. Thank you. Uh, let me now turn to Stefan Chambers. 
Um, good morning, good, good evening. Um, um, it's an enormous honor to be here in memory of Prof Soren and to see so many people here who care about how deeply he touched us at the LST. Um, I promise that Minister Tharman and Shaleen and I did not rehearse our comments, uh, but what you're gonna hear from me in my five minute version of philanthropy touches on almost every point that both have made uh, today. Um, I work on philanthropy at the LSE, that $1.5 trillion asset class that Manoush mentioned at the beginning. And that, that set of activities that ranges from very small acts of kindness that we all do to the disbursement of funds from foundations with tens of billions of dollars in their endowments. Um, and as we've heard, philanthropy, particularly big philanthropy, is booming. There's a transfer of wealth between generations, uh, between men and women, and a significant contribution of private donations to science, medicine, public health, development, crisis support, and humanitarian assistance. And there are all kinds of interesting innovations in philanthropy that, that promise a great deal. Novel financial instruments, grants that convert into equity, for example, and the whole field of impact uh, investing. Without philanthropy, many of our problems, both immediate and acute and systemic and chronic, would look worse. And yet, and there's always an and yet, isn't there, in these stories, and yet this so-called second golden age of giving, um, there's been quite a lot of criticism. Very roughly that criticism follows three paths. The critique from transparency, the critique from inequality, and the critique from diversity. I mean, there are others of course, but I'll focus in the few minutes that we have on those three. The critique from transparency, so unlike governments, which we can, at least in theory, dismiss, we can't dismiss foundation executives or trustees, and they often don't tell us what they're doing or why they're doing it, and they often don't publish uh, the data that allows us to compare different kinds of interventions. So those who worry about transparency worry that we grant big philanthropy, tax reliefs and privacy to alter systems that are sensitive education of uh, children, for example, and which concern everyone. So let's call this the we can't unelect them problem. Okay. The critique from inequality. In order to have billions to give away, you have to have made billions in the first place, and that suggests structural inequality. It also suggests that many of the problems philanthropists seek to fix are a function of the very system that made them rich. So let's call this the sticking plaster problem. The critique from diversity. People giving away money are too far from the problem they seek to address, and they don't represent those whom they seek to help. So the problems get worse and the divisions between those spoken for and those spoken with widen. Let's call this the well-meaning stranger problem. So those are three of the things that are widely discussed at the moment and these problems are not trivial and they should concern us. We can't simply dismiss them as motivated by envy or worse. For there to be a flourishing and legitimate philanthropic sector we must continuously make the case for philanthropy. So here's my case for philanthropy. While the scale of philanthropic capital, and you know, 1.5 trillion, it is minuscule by comparison with the financial capacity of states. While that is clearly true, it's also clearly true that it's a vital source of innovation and experimentation. Philanthropy is society's early stage risk capital. And we should think of it as having equally high impact on new ways of addressing problems, de-risking follow-on capital, as the minister said. And we should be comfortable with commensurately high failure rates. Philanthropy allows us to experiment 
and sort out what does or what might work and allows any given sector to have lots of actors all trying to sort out what works best. So not only is it a source of experimentation, but it's also a source of plurality. It can crowd in people who wouldn't otherwise be working on a particular problem. For philanthropy to address the systematic causes of the problems it addresses, it must invest in primary research. I mean, I would say this, wouldn't I? But lots of uncoordinated grants seeking a single solution to complex problems that lots of, per, that lots of people already work on in places like the LSC, it's unlikely to be productive. Every major grant should embed a commitment to open source data and primary research. Each philanthropic act would add to the public understanding when its work succeeds or fails. And there's quite a lot to be learned, of course, from failed initiatives. That commitment might go some way to addressing some of the current questions around legitimacy. And last, philanthropy needs to embrace humility. We need to recognize that speaking for is not the same as speaking with, that others know things that we don't, and we need a clear sight of our own problems if we're to contribute to solving the problems of others. This is what Shaleen was talking about when she talked about voice and agency and co-creation. So look, there are rarely simple answers to complex questions, and I've given you simple answers to complex questions for which I apologize. Philanthropy isn't apart from the way we organize the world. And many of the features of philanthropy speak to the way we organize the world. It's important, it's contested, and it's difficult. All things we value at the LSE and which Prof saw would recognize as part of our purpose. And finally, um, I wanted to recall Huan's quote from Prof Saw, his view that philanthropy has very powerful signaling power. Huan said, you'll recall, that Prof Saw said, we can encourage others to give by doing so ourselves. That signaling is very powerful. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan, for those very thoughtful remarks. Thank you very much. Let me turn finally to Hyun Shin. Um, I think uh, my understanding is that we'll be uh, collecting some questions um, for Q&A, uh, given the time, remaining time. And then I make a final remark before the end of the talk, before handing over back to you, Minish. Very good. Well, maybe Hyun, if it's all right, I might start with the first question uh, while the audience uh, uh, gathers its thoughts. Uh, and one, um, just one observation, you know, historically, in many places, philanthropy was very focused on building institutions uh, and establishing institutions. And more recently, there's been a shift toward a more sort of programmatic approach. We don't care about the institution, we care about a program to fight HIV or a program to deal with malaria or a program to get underprivileged children into better education, et cetera. And I wanted to ask the panel's thoughts on that, on taking an institutional approach versus a programmatic approach and what you think the strengths and weaknesses of both those. And I see Tarman nodding, so I'm gonna to turn to Tarman first because I think he's got a view. That's a very good question, uh, Minoush. Uh, part of the problem we face today in global health um, is a fragmentation. Uh, many organizations, each with specific mandates aimed at specific diseases or specific types of interventions, uh, funded uh, variously by different philanthropic uh, contributions and sometimes bilateral official contributions, um, and a weakening of the role of the WHO over the last 20 years as a result of this sort of um, siloed uh, effort to fund specific programs with specific mandates. Um, I don't think it should be an either or. Mm. I think 
Looking back now, there should have been an attempt to strengthen the role of the WHO, as well as to develop this ecosystem where you have non-official players or not fully multilateral players working together with the WHO, but with the WHO at the center. And the programmatic funding really need to apply across these institutions. So the, the problem we face in global health, and which has been uh, a very important part of the reason why we ended, we've ended up in this uh, pandemic that has carried on mm. without bold solution, is that of fragmentation. And the solution, therefore, has to involve strengthening the role of the WHO, but also providing a multilateral mechanism that allows you to cover institutions collectively rather than fund them individually. Mm -hmm. And this multilateral mechanism requires official money, but it should also catalyze philanthropic resources and even private money. Uh, that's our task now, is really to bind the system together. It needs a lot more resourcing. In other words, we've got to relieve, we've got to address the gross underfunding of the system, but it's not just about money being distributed to existing pots separately. It's about finding a mechanism in which we can, at, we can allocate money to where the gaps are the biggest and get institutions to work together collectively to plug those gaps. And that's a task now for the G20 to take on, to exercise leadership in developing those multilateral mechanisms that bring institutions together collectively with the WHO very much at the center. The weakening of the WHO over the last two decades uh, has had uh, very adverse consequences for the world. Yeah, agreed. Let me check if Stefan and Shailene would like to add anything. Stefan? Well, I mean, I think what's interesting about your question is that it kind of tracks what's happened in philanthropy. We've moved from a world in which we didn't know whether what we were spending money on worked or not to a world in which we do know, but we're doing much narrower things, which are much more de-risked. Mm. And what we probably need to do is to correct that very clear trajectory from a, you know, let's just give some money to a large um, uh, institution and see what happens, mm. to a programmatic focus, which says, let's build monitoring and evaluation and, and uh, analysis into everything we do, which drives it to the program level. Um, um, uh, but what that does is create exactly the things that Thaman has talked about, discontinuities, disaggregated solutions, lack of transparency, yeah. lack of coordination, all of those then coordination costs. Well, so I think- And lack of sustainability, because then these of programs end, and then what happens kind of- So although it sounds a complete heresy, I think we've got to move back now away from this focus on de-risking philanthropy to up-risking it, but making it making it more coordinated. Shaleen, did you want to add anything? Um, well, I was just gonna say sort of the same thing, but um, talking about um, Stefan's point about uncoordinated, right? Um, I feel that a lot of times programs are um, all trying to fix the same problem. And so there's a lot of inefficiencies. Um, and if we can have institutions that can sort of place the um, importance of, of the different projects and then have programs. So you need to have the head to tell the rest of the body what to do, right? And I feel that sometimes that's lost without the institutions. So you need a bit of both. Yeah, okay. Uh, Tarman, you wanted to add something. Well, I, I was just reminded that um, I was listening to uh, Dr. Tredros yesterday uh, at a WHO press conference on the launch of their Economic Council's report. And, um, you know, to the great credit of the WHO, uh, it has responded to the recommendations of a G20 panel that I happen to co-chair with Ngozi and Lauren Summers, a recommendation that we set up this coordinating board at the G20 plus, when we say plus means it's got to involve the African Union, it's got to involve sufficient representation from the developing world, a coordinating board of health and finance. Now, the WHO could have easily taken the view that some have taken, which is that everything has to be done in the WHO. But they took a more elevated view, and Tedros expressed it very strongly yesterday in his press conference, that we have to support a coordinating mechanism that brings everyone together. Mm -hmm. 
and it involves the WHO at the center, but it involves other organizations as well. And he also supported the need for a new financing mechanism that's not just in the WHO for the WHO's own operations, but a multilateral funding financing mechanism to do exactly what we're talking about, which is to fund across the system. It is gravely underfunded and it's fragmented. And when the next pandemic comes, we might learn a lesson as harsh or worse that we have had in COVID-19. Very good point. Let me turn it over to Hyun, who will manage uh, questions from the audience. Great, very much happy to do this. Uh, to do so. Uh, we have a very interesting set of questions uh, in the Q&A window, and perhaps I try to collect about two or three questions at the same time and hand over to our speakers uh, to respond. I think the first question you can start with is a question from, I think this is probably a question more uh, specifically for Stefan as a start. Uh, and it comes from Bindu uh, Berkatesh, who's asking, isn't the system of philanthropy in an unbalanced world enabling more inequality? And I think this speaks to some of the points Stefan was raising regarding the inequality issues. Um, uh, Bindu Bod asks, wouldn't taxing the rich actually help government have funds to support the poor with more systematic support? Uh, there's another question, I think this is for Taman uh, in particular, uh, asked by Anthony Sykes, who is an LSE alumnus. Given that there are uh, an estimated 2,800 billionaires in the world, how does the state encourage those individuals to provide philanthropic investment? And I think a related question from Rui from LSC uh, um, will be, uh, what do you see the role of government and the impact of national regulatory uh, systems on philanthropy? And finally, a question for Charlene, um, a question from uh, Zayed or Ziet, uh, an LSE stu uh, MSc student in London. Would you agree with the notion that wealthy elites who have the most to lose from genuine social changes have placed themselves at the center of social change through philanthropy. Why should the elite choose which social problems need fixing? I have directed these questions to each one of you, but um, you're more than welcome uh, to respond to other questions that have been posed here. So let's start with these three, uh, uh, four sets of questions and uh, perhaps uh, hand over to Stefan uh, uh, to start the uh, response. Stefan, over to you. Okay, thanks, Hyun. Um, so. So um, Bindu is asking a question about inequality and tax. And um, the, the, the one answer to your question, Bindu, is yes. Uh, and the other answer to your question is no. So, so let, let me explain. Um, I mean, clearly it's the case that um, uh, philanthropy is both needed and exists because, because um, uh, resources are not equitably distributed around the world. There is enough, and Tharman and Manoush will, 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 will be able to correct me if I'm wrong about this, but very roughly speaking, there is enough money in the world to sustain human life at an averagely better level of flourishing than, than, than uh, it currently is the case. So this is a transaction and distribution problem. So, so the answer to your question is yes, you know, philanthropy is the corollary of inequality. The other slightly longer answer to your question is, yes, of course, tax is relevant. And if you think about the tax concessions to philanthropy, what that does effectively is raise the hurdle rate for philanthropy's efficiency. In other words, if you get a 50% break on every dollar in order to turn it into a philanthropic dollar, and the state is giving you that break, you need to double the performance of that dollar in order to match what the state might theoretically do with that dollar, okay? So that's the yes bit of, of my answer to your question. The no bit is um, all the things that I talked about earlier on, which have to do with incentives for innovation and experimentation in ways that states would find it impossible to do. Um, um, and the emergent and complex um, nature of problems which are often right at the edge of the things that we need to be thinking about. So I think it's a, it's a complex question. Um, you know, if you, if you frame it as a simple kind of A, B thing, should we, should we abolish philanthropy um, uh, and replace it with a, with a more just form of taxation? I think I would argue no. 
if you said, should we reform philanthropy and, and, and add it to a more just redistributive taxation system, I would say yes. So I'm sorry to give you both yes and no answers to your question. Thank you. Um, why don't you hand over uh, the mic to uh, uh, Taman? Thanks. Well, uh, if I could follow on from what uh, Professor Stefan Chambers um, uh, said, and I think he, he expressed this uh, very well. Uh, you know, the answers are going to be in the large space in between the extreme options. Um, in an ideal world, uh, governments would think long term everywhere for their own national investments in public goods. Uh, and they would also think collectively, internationally, for investments in global public goods. The investments required to address pandemic security, for instance, and a good part of the investments required to provide climate security, security from the climate crisis. That's in an ideal world. Um, and unfortunately, uh, both have been in ever short supply. Governments are retreating from investments in public goods nationally, certainly across the advanced world. And it's always been in very short supply in the developing world, a chronic lack of investment in basic public amenities required for ordinary people to live decent and dignified lives. And governments have been uh, increasingly unwilling to do something that's patently in everyone's, every country's interest, which is to invest collectively in global public goods, which is why we've had such a horrendously costly crisis this time around, costly to human life and human well-being and economically costly, just the failure to invest in global public goods. So that's the ideal world which we are not in, that we are patently not in. And that's why, if you look today at global health, a very substantial part of the funding has come from philanthropic resources, the Gates Foundation, Wellcome Trust, Rockefeller Foundation, and some others. And it's, it's very, uh, a, it's a, you know, a, a great asset to have those contributions. They've contributed greatly to the world, but that's greatly inadequate because the public sector globally is not playing its part. So if we only rely on philanthropies, we will be having an uncoordinated system, well thought through within many of these foundations, but not necessarily sustainable, and not coordinated enough to have real impact, and overall inadequate, just inadequate resources. If you were to hope that governments could in fact do this instead. I think that's ideal, but it hasn't happened. And the political economy of what's happening in a whole range of democracies doesn't lead you to the idea that it's going to happen anytime soon. So we have a problem. So the solutions that we should be looking for are solutions that involve public, philanthropic, and private partnership. And we have to find practical ways of enhancing the amount of resources that go into public goods, find ways in which government money plays a catalytic role, and philanthropic money also plays a catalytic role to prod governments into putting more money into public goods and to incentivize the private sector to come in. So it really is about plus, plus, plus. It's not about one or the other. It's about catalyzing the enhanced financing of public goods from all three sources, all three pools of funds, government, philanthropic, and private. And that's why uh, what Stefan was just talking about is an important dimension, uh, important and neglected dimension of public policy, which is how do governments structure incentives for philanthropic financing of what is in the public good? How much skin in the game should governments have? in the process. So you're not just enjoining people to come and contribute. You're not just making a clarion call, but you're actually incentivizing it in real and tangible ways. And there is a role 
for tax credits. There's a rule for tax incentives, suitably designed. And if you look at it at a global scale, the advantage of having the public sector involved in a serious way in the funding of public goods, global public goods, is that it's not just the money, it's also about the coordination. You do need to coordinate across countries from different bilateral sources, and you need to coordinate amongst philanthropic sources so that we are having the right amounts of money going into the right areas, and we achieve greater impact and greater sustainability of these investments. And that coordinating role is best done collectively by the global public sector. You need strong institutions, which goes back to Minusha's point. You need institutions that are multilateral, or close to multilateral that coordinate this. And this is entirely achievable. It's entirely achievable. We have to bring the concept of the public sector back into public life nationally and globally. And it performs not just the role of incentivizing and putting skin in the game, it provides a coordinating role. And that way, the good thinking and the good doing of the philanthropic sector has much more impact. So it's not either or, we've got to avoid the extremes. And if I could just speak for a minute more about this, um, because I saw some of the other questions um, addressing this issue. Um, if I talk in very stylized terms, you've got a US system type approach where you have um, you know, some extraordinary wealth you also have loopholes in the tax system that enable extraordinary wealth to uh, get away with very low taxation. Some of that extraordinary wealth goes into very good causes, often with the credit of names being attached to the causes. A lot of it doesn't. You have the uh, European system, and I again talk here in very stylized terms, uh, where uh, you have very high tax rates on ordinary people, as well as on wealthy people. And the state performs the task of redistributing. But you have what Minush has observed over time, a transactional approach to this whole business of the, the collective well-being. And you don't have enough ownership of people, enough vesting of people in the causes that are important. I think we need both. You need a redistributive state, but not taken to the extreme. And you need the goodwill and good thinking and the orchestration of private giving so as to serve the public good. Because, and you need the public sector to incentivize it as well. And the rationale, the economic rationale for the public sector to incentivize it and put skin in the game is that the social return on these investments in public goods, most and you know most vividly ex, uh, exemplified in global public health, where the social return on the investments we must make for pandemic preparedness is huge compared to the amounts that the public sector has to invest. Invest because you're going to save immense costs that comes when you have a global health crisis. You spend some billions collectively globally in order to save trillions. So it's an immense social return, and it requires public sector resources and public sector incentivization of private resources and private sec public sector coordination of philanthropic resources. So it's not an either or, and there is a space in between the stylized US model, very heavily reliant on private thinking and private decision making, and with tax loose loopholes allowing for extreme wealth accumulation, and on the other hand, the stylized European model, which depends very largely on the state and doesn't have enough ownership on the part of those who are better off to, to really serve a public purpose, there's a large space in between. And it requires careful design of public policy nationally, and it requires coordination internationally, including the strengthening of global public institutions. Great. Thank you so much. Um... Before uh, we hand over to uh, Charlene, I'm being a please always feel free to join in if you would like to add your thoughts. And I see your mic, uh, mic being on mute, so perhaps you have a few words to say? For me. Um, 
But if you'd like to, otherwise we'll hand over to Shailene. No, Shailene, you go ahead first. Shailene, okay, thank you. you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think um, our quest, my question was about um, wealthy elites and um, whether they've placed themselves at the center of social change. Um, I feel that like um, to echo what Senior Minister Thaman and Stefan have both said, um, there's a part to play for both sides, the, the public and private um, side, um, because a lot of times it is about alignment of interests. It's about um, trying to fix problems that are sometimes ignored um, and um, trying to just bring awareness to these issues. You know, not all governments are altruistic, not all philanthropists are either. But, you know, I think if we work together, we can solve a lot more problems than if we depended on only one type of um, um, institution to do that, right? Um, and I feel that what uh, philanthropists could do is to bring to light issues that are often ignored by institutions and governments. And, um, you know, just to, to um, highlight other problems or lesser problems perhaps, right? You know, when I'm not talking about a, a pandemic and world health, you know, we're talking more very specifically to um, women's health, for example, or specifically to education, which some people may not value as highly when there's a global pandemic going on. But these issues still happen every day. And we need to address those at the same time. Um, I feel like this isn't a competition. It shouldn't be a competition. What we're looking for is a social contract. We're trying to make the place a better world um, as a community. And um, if we all work together, um, I think we can achieve that. Great, thank you so much. Um, yes, Minish, uh, would you like to add a few more words? I, I just want to, I mean, I very much agree with the fact that, you know, you need a fair tax system and a philanthropy sits comfortably alongside that. If you have a very unfair tax system, it's really, the, the contrast is too stark. But I think also there's an interesting line of kind of debate around the question that I think both Stefan and Tarman raised, which is how much incentive should governments give to, to incentivize philanthropy and what should those be? So just a small example, in the UK at the moment, there's a lively debate about should private schools have tax exempt charitable status? And many of them provide no particular public good, frankly. They provide a very elite education for children who are from already very wealthy families. So it's very hard to understand why they get tax breaks because they're essentially delivering a private good, not a public good. And I think that's a really good debate to be having. And I think we should think about widening that debate more to say, okay, what are the public goods we want to incentivize philanthropists to do? And which of the ones are really basically private goods and we should just not give them tax breaks to do that. And I think I just wanted to put that issue on the table for discussion. Well, thank you very much. I completely agree with that, but with one caveat of caution, just as soon as you make that move, um, you make it very difficult for people to fund things that look like private goods, let's call it opera but might not be private goods okay let's right. call it arts more generally right so so but i'm completely sympathetic to your to so let's let's agree that it's extremely important to fund opera and arts and it is uh, a very bad idea to fund private schools uh but uh, if i could uh, carry on uh, in this in the spirit of minutia's question one of the challenges that has come up in this crisis, which uh, had not been addressed before in public policy, is that of providing for adequate manufacturing capacity for vaccines and other critical medical supplies ahead of a pandemic. Now, why is it necessary? COVID-19 is exhibit A. What's happened in COVID-19? is that we had a remarkable space of development of vaccines, but two years on, most of the world's population is still not vaccinated. Mm. And as a result, mutations of the virus continue and the pandemic is prolonged for everyone, quite apart from it having horrendous consequences on the populations that are not vaccinated. 
And despite the best efforts of the private sector, and I'm not getting into the debate about IP and so on, despite the best efforts of the private sector to roll this out as quickly as possible, more manufacturing capacity and more supply, it's very slow. And in a pandemic, what we've learned more vividly in this crisis than ever before, speed and scale is everything. Speed and scale is everything because you're at a race against virus mutations. And the only way you're going to achieve that speed and scale is by having ahead of time adequate manufacturing capacity and delivery capacity. Now, how do you achieve that ahead of time? There isn't a strong enough private incentive for the large pharmaceutical companies included to have manufacturing facilities available before the next pandemic, because first, they're not quite sure exactly which pathogen is going to be involved. And secondly, which vaccine is going to succeed against that pathogen. You only know during the event when you start you know exactly what you're up against, what type of pathogen. You then take it through phase one, phase two, phase three trials, and you hope for regulatory clearance. And the record in vaccine development is that most fail. So there's very little incentive to set up custom-made manufacturing facilities ahead of time that you don't know if they're really going to be the successful candidates during a pandemic. And the solution to that is this. It does take private capital and public capital together. And the case for public capital in what are private facilities, although they can also have some public ownership, is simply this. The social returns of public investment in these facilities, be it by way of a grant or an equity investment or a tax incentive, the social return of that public investment vastly exceeds the private returns that come from that investment ahead of time. Mm. There is a gap. A social return means society will benefit. And you have to invest in a range of, of manufacturing facilities aimed at different candidates, aimed at different pathogens and different vaccine candidates, even for the same pathogen. It requires a global network. And that comes back to the question of coordination. You need international coordination for this. But the case for making this investment is that the social return nationally and internationally, vastly exceeds the private return ahead of time, ahead of a pandemic. And it's a powerful economic case. In fact, there's no, no public sector investment that will yield as high a social return as investing in manufacturing capacity for vaccines and other medical countermeasures ahead of a pandemic. And then we do, of course, have to find the best users of these facilities in normal times. And there is a use for these facilities, particularly with mRNA uh, 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 vaccine manufacturing, because you can use it for endemic diseases as much as possible in normal times. But we should be willing to maintain excess capacity. Mm. And that excess capacity comes from having more candidates being invested in rather than just betting on one. And it requires simple extra capacity beyond what is being utilized, because that way you can respond respond with speed and scale when an actual pandemic comes and it saves the world and individual nations a huge cost, human cost and economic cost. Great. Um, given the remaining time, you know, if this happens always with the exciting events like this and you know, whenever we you know, dive into you know, a very exciting debate, you know, we are reaching the end of our allocated session. What I would like to and I uh, pose to the speakers as a way of concluding is um, the philanthropy, uh, which is often equated with philanthropy of the rich, right? but I think we are also um, reminded of various philanthropic act, uh, act uh, pursued by the ordinary, uh, not so rich and also economically worse off. I, I sometimes come across with the news, for example, in South Korea, where street vendors save you know, as much as they can out of their you know, meager you know, income for you know, donating to universities for future education and so on. So I think perhaps, and I like really like the way Charlene was you know, referring to you and know, quoting uh, your father's you know, remark where uh, philanthropy you know, begins at home. And I, I believe this home doesn't, it's not necessarily confined to the homes of the rich, but also the homes of the ordinary people. So I want to kind of ask any you know, of these speakers, 
uh, to respond concisely, by the way, um, hopefully spending not more than two minutes. What would you, would you, how would you see the, the, the role of philanthropy, uh, uh, philanthropic act in a, uh, to be pursued by uh, not so rich and also economically worse, of, especially in times of austerity and also in times of the pandemic? Mm. Maybe I start with Charlene, uh, if that's okay. Um, so I feel like, yes, there is a part to play for everyone. Everyone has a part to play. Um, and I feel that um, just by contributing your thoughts and your voice, that is in itself a co philanthropic contribution, right? It's not just about the dollars, it's about the time, the energy, and the effort that you put into something. And um, I feel that if we can work together, especially with the beneficiaries, with the foresight to solving a problem, um, that is to me the real value in giving, you know, to, to solve an issue together. Um, there was a quote that I think um, people have attributed to Gandhi and it says, what you do for me, but without me, you do against me. And I feel that if we can all think about that as more of a collective me, um, you know, and, and as a society, think about how we can better society. I think that is um, the key for me. And everyone can play that part. Great, thank you very much. Stefan or Thurman, who would you like to go next? So, so when, when, when we talk about philanthropy, we, we, we always gravitate towards um, very famous individuals with billions of dollars or very large foundations, okay? And we forget that philanthropy is a system which runs from um, individual acts of generosity with time as well as money, with network capital as well as financial capital and so on. So I would say thing one, you know, remember philanthropy is, is complex, okay? It doesn't only involve money and it doesn't only involve large institutions. It also involves faith groups and culture and, and, and acts of generosity. And then second, I think we should probably start thinking um, in the, in the, in the in the language of my colleague Navar Ashraf, we should start thinking about altruistic capital more generally. You know, we should start thinking about a, a kind of capital like network capital or cultural capital or social capital or financial capital that is altruistic capital and to see whether there are mechanisms and incentives um, for measuring it, for increasing it, for, for understanding how it flows around the world. Excellent. Last but not least, uh, Taman, over to you. Well, it's a very good question. Um, the word philanthropy comes from the Greek, Greek philanthropia, comprising of two root words, phil and anthropos. Phil meaning love or fondness, Anthropos meaning humankind. Philanthropy means a love for our fellow human beings in our own societies or wherever they are. And it comes not just from the ultra wealthy, it comes from everyone. It comes from the poor as well. And what we've seen in this crisis is in fact, I mean, one of the positive things in this crisis in many societies, including societies that have been rift with divisions is a certain outpouring of collective spirit people wanting to help others in the neighborhood people wanting to help others that lacked something that they had for instance one of the largest inequities around the world not enough light being shone on it but one of the largest inequities around the world has been the gap in education and learning that's opened up during this crisis as a result of a year and in some places close to 20 months of lost learning. And the digital learning solution was the very obvious one, but it comes very easily to those who are better off within each society. And it comes much more easily within advanced countries and upper middle income countries compared to poor countries. So there's a huge gap that's widened up. But you've had lots of initiatives that have come up. 
in, in Singapore, for instance, we've seen that, where corporations, including large corporations like Singtel, as well as NGOs, have come to life, NGOs have come to life addressing the task of refurbishing old laptops. As you know, old laptops are often very good laptops, but the manufacturers have a way of making sure you replace them quite, quite early. So there's a huge resource of existing laptops, laptops and computers and other devices and refurbishing them to be able to provide them to families and students that did not have them has been a, a very good expression of this. And there are many other expressions of how people use the skill they have. They don't need a huge, huge amount of resources to do something that helps others. Love for our fellow human beings. Great. Many thanks to our speakers uh, and the audience for such engaging and insightful discussions during the Q&A. Before we finish, uh, please allow me to spend a few minutes to say a few words about Professor So and his impact on research and education here at LSE. First, I'd like to share a few images. I still fondly remember my first visit to his office. Um, at the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies uh, located within the National University of Singapore campus, where he was greeting me and my colleague with a welcoming smile and his wisdom. He would occasionally share his thoughts with us by fax. And yes, you heard it right, fax, not emails. Sometimes they came as typed up letters, but more recently as handwritten ones. He was enthusiastic about the Southeast Asia Forum, the annual flagship conference hosted by the LSE Southeast Asia Center. And the picture on the right was indeed taken in one of these forums. He was keen to attend the 2019 forum as his letter illustrates here, although this did not happen due to changing circumstances at the time. He would often send me clips of newspaper articles as an academics of his time would usually do. These were collected whenever he saw opportunities to connect reports to the work of this uh, LSE and the Southeast Asia Center. Knowing that I was from South Korea originally, he included news clips on South Korea and ASEAN relations. During his time, um, Professor So donated generously to higher education institutions, one of the most notable destinations being the NSC, where the student body is made up of around 8% of students from Southeast Asia, with 13% of undergraduate students from the region. Indeed, Professor So C. Hawk was very much part of LSE. He received his PhD in statistics at LSE in 1963. He was made the school's honorary fellow in 2005 and also received LSE's inaugural Distinguished Alumni Leadership Award in 2015. He was a generous benefactor whose donations precipitated the opening of Sosi Hawk Student Center and also established the Southeast Asia Center that was also named after him. In 2014, Forbes Asia Magazine named him as one of the 48 heroes of philanthropy in the Asia Pacific region. And he was one of the only two who had academic backgrounds while almost all others were in the business. We should also not forget that he was a renowned academic in his field of studies, having published some 49 books and over 100 articles on statistics, demography, and investment. For Professor So, supporting education was one of his lifetime goals. I have learned that he depended on scholarship to do his own studies. And here I quote his son, Matthew So's remark that appeared in the Straight Times which was saying, education was how he made a better life for himself. I think that's why he believed so much in education. He wanted to give others the opportunities he was given before, end of quote. At the time of receiving the President's Volunteerism and Philanthropy Award in 2013, conferred by the President of the Republic of Singapore, 
Professor So said he was giving mostly to universities to help needy students and to promote research and education, and the quote. Indeed, the impact of Professor So on LSE is strongly felt in the school's research and education. Each year, LSE students are supported through the dissertation period of grants and undergraduate research fellowships, for example, which are run by the Southeast Asia Center. The center also provides support for the student union, Southeast Asian regional societies by hosting regular meetings with their leaders and mentoring academic activities. Because of Professor So's generosity, the So C. Hook Southeast Asia Center that I direct, which was established in 2014, has grown to become one of the world leading centers on Southeast Asian affairs by carrying out research and organizing various academic activities that deepen our understanding of the regions urbanization, connectivity, and governance issues in particular. Professor So's gift has enabled a number of LSE academics, including myself, to investigate key social, political, economic, and policy issues, which include, for example, the impact of COVID-19 on Southeast Asia, the urban agency of global China in the region, the social construction of hate season in Singapore, deforestation, communal violence, and the Trans-Pacific Partnership to name only a few. The center's research seminars bring together both established and emerging scholars. The center has turned the pandemic generated challenges into opportunities by shifting to seminars fully online to engage with our audience based in Southeast Asia. As a result, about one third of our event attendees are regularly connecting from Southeast Asia. The ensuing academic debates are further supported by the center's LSE Southeast Asia blog which is a global platform that sees hundreds of visits every day. Contributions to the Southeast Asia blog come from across the world, and all these activities endeavor to give voices to researchers and students in Southeast Asia, and not just those at LSE. The Center's Early Career Research Network brings together more than 150 researchers across the world, and supported by various target events such as the Digital Summer School and Auto Meet Early Careers Roundtables, this strengthened the, uh, the network that continues to be a key focus for the center as we aim to develop the next generation of Southeast Asian scholars. Thank you, Professor So, for making such work possible. We'll be eternally thankful to call Professor So an alumnus of LSE and supporter of the school and the Socio Southeast Asia Center. We remember his extraordinary modesty, warmth, kindness, judicious insight, and of course, the glint in his eyes with his wonderful sense of humor and the laughter that always followed. Professor So will be deeply missed and we are grateful that his legacy lives on at LSE through the Socio Southeast Asian Center and the various schemes they have uh, promoted. And I think that's it from me and I hand over back to Minish for her final remark and the conclusion of the event. Over to you, Thank Minish. Thank you, Hyun. I'm, I'm glad to see uh, you weren't the only one who used to get newspaper clippings from Prof. Saw. I, I remember receiving one in his office, which he showed me very proudly, the front page of the newspaper in Singapore, which announced what a high proportion of the cabinet, the newly appointed cabinet in Singapore were all LSE alumni. And he was absolutely proud and delighted uh, that the impact the LSE was having on, on Singapore. I think he would have been incredibly delighted to be with us today and to hear these comments and to participate in this debate. And the fact that we're here discussing these issues is such an important part of his legacy. So it has been such a pleasure to be with all of you today to commemorate Professor Saul Suihak, and I'm especially grateful to his family who have joined us today. Thank you in the audience. And of course, a special thanks to Senior Minister Tarman, to Shailene, to Stefan, and to Hyun for taking part. Uh, it has been uh, a wonderful occasion, a time of, of memories about the past, but also thinking about the future. And I think Prof. Saul would have approved. Thank you all very much. <laughs>